Welcome to the Essential Element, the Elements of Education podcast. I'm Christian Page, and I'm your host. Today, we have a conversation with our friend Kay. Uh, Kay is the theater director at Soda. Uh, we talk a lot about art, about discovering yourself, and about the importance of those things, both in mentor group and in the classroom. So without further ado, here's a conversation with our friend Kay. The art school, we really believe in like relationships and that is emphasized through mentor group. And so um, I wholeheartedly believe in that. What do they need? I have to be able to answer that question. And that takes a little bit of time. The biggest teacher, I think, is failure. The brain works in failure. And those failures are actually synapses rewiring themselves in your brain. And think about where you want to be. Because when you find your place, you find your people. And our purpose is attached to People. You know, when there's a phenomenal teacher, uh, when there's a phenomenal educator, when there's a phenomenal mentor, one of the mistakes that we make is we make it look too easy. Like everyone sees the shining moment on stage. No one sees, right, like the hard time spent. All right. Well, welcome to the Essential Element, the Elements of Education podcast. I'm Christian Page. I'm your host. Uh, you all are familiar with my partner in crime, Zach Barnell. Uh, and today we have a special guest named Kay Onoradi. Um, Kay, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your role here in the schools and how you found yourself in education. Yeah, thank you, Christian and Zach, for having me here. I actually started out not wanting to be in education. That was- Hey, the, me too. <laughs> I know, right? That was the last thing I wanted to do. When I was 14, I ran a theater camp for homeschool kids um, mm. that was not something that was there. And I really wanted it because I really wanted to be an actor. And so homeschool kids, we all got together and we put together a play and I directed the play at 14. And then my parents sat me down and were like, you should be a teacher. And I was like, um, no, I am going to be an actor. Thank you very much. Um, so I ended up going to college for acting and actual education as well to add on a little bit onto my resume. I then went on to tour with Missoula Children's Theater, which was a lot of fun. And so I got to go across the country and I fell in love with teaching kids theater. Part of what we do um, when we're on tours do educational reach out. And I was a part of the educational reach out. And so I got to teach these kids all over the country. I think I visited 42 different states mm. um, and over 150 communities and I fell in love with teaching. And then I was like, darn it. <laughs> I was like, my parents were right and this is very annoying. But usually the people in your life are right. They can see things before you see them and it's really cool that they see that. I ended up coming home off of tour and ended up going into educational theater and started teaching and directing at different children's theaters until I found a role at Soda that I found super cool, which was I was a paraeducator. And so I got to work with students with differing needs. And I really felt like I had found my home at Soda. And I was like, well, I want to stay here and I want to continue. And I also want to do theater here. And so I ended up becoming a substitute teacher mm -hmm. and I started subbing all sorts of classes. I became a long term sub for a math class um, for quite some time. and. Actually, the students that I had for their freshman year are now seniors in my theater classes, which is really exciting um, to see their full like growth, not only in math, but also in theater. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up going and getting my master's in teaching. And mm -hmm. I'm now the director of theater arts here. And it has been honestly the absolute pleasure of my life, like to be able to say that I get to teach theater full time. And I also get to perform full time because every single day is a performance in one way or another, helping kids become better and helping myself become better as well. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And I'm glad that um, this is something that you love and you get to do it daily. I'm, uh, I both love hate relationship with and they saw it. Yes. <laughs> right. And they were right. Right. Um, but I would imagine that as a theater teacher or the director of the theater program, that that's sometimes the relationship that you have with students as well. Right. You can see them sometimes before they see themselves. 
And I know one of our four major growth goals here is discovering yourself, right? And so yeah. uh, if you could, like walk us through, right? Like you see gold in someone um, and you're helping them, mentoring them to discover it for themselves. Mm -hmm. how, how does that play out uh, in your work or in the classroom? Well, the cool thing is, is that it plays out in so many different ways, right? And sometimes you see something in someone and you encourage them and you don't get to know whether or not that actually ended up going somewhere, but you know that you planted a seed. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. other times you see someone and you're like, wow, I see this spark in them. Mm -hmm. And you're like, how can I help ignite it? How can I help put them on fire for whatever this is? And so then I usually help find them resources and I go and discover with them. And I think that is, the greatest journey for me is when I get to discover with the student what these things are to them. And then sometimes they discover, oh, nope, that was not the thing. And that is totally fine mm -hmm. because that is a discovery within itself because then you know that's not something that you want to do and that is more than okay. And then sometimes you have the kids who never wanted to step foot on stage but I heard them singing in the hallway earlier, you know, <laughs> like, and they were good. Yeah. And so you just start pushing them a little bit towards the stage, just tiny bit, just little baby pushes. And then all of a sudden they're on the stage and they're doing these amazing things. We had a freshman who is now a senior and they are an absolutely incredible actor. You would not know that their freshman year because mm. they talked like this. Hi, my name is so-and-so. And now they're playing main roles inside of the theater and they wow. are just boasting with it. And that is because of the community and the community that has been encouraging them and who saw that spark and pushes it. And the really great thing is I also have a team who we oftentimes are like, we see the spark in this kid. And so we're like, yes, we're going to all help ignite that spark. And it's really great being able to work with a team like that. That is really all going to um, look out for the best interest of these students. That's great. Um, when you think about um, that process, like for that ninth grade student that came in mm -hmm. as a freshman, um, a lot of times we get to witness this like, man, this is such a cheesy metaphor, so I'm sorry, <laughs> but like this flower <laughs> opening up and blossoming, right? That's like the, the cheesy analogy, but you do yeah. help students discover who they are. And there's something really special and magical about theater about being on stage mm -hmm. that forces introspection which is somewhat ironic because you think you're going out on stage you're performing it you're projecting outward but it actually seems to be a really powerful process yeah. to let students discover who they are internally do you feel like being able to teach theater allows that process of self-discovery oh absolutely because the first thing that we talk about when we start talking about acting is that you cannot know a character until you know yourself mm. Because yeah. there are bits and parts of you that will end up empathizing with anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. Because even though we don't have the same situations that happen to us, oftentimes we have the same feelings yeah. that happen in those situations. So, Zach, you might have been through something that was really scary. And I've also been through something that's really scary. Christian, you've probably been through something really scary at some point. All of our situations of why we were scared are probably different. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is we have that communal feeling of being scared or the communal feeling of being loved or the communal feeling of being accepted. And so when we can know when those times are for us, when we have felt scared, when we have felt loved, when we have felt accepted, we can then empathize with other people and also the characters that we're portraying on stage. Mm -hmm. The more you know yourself, the better you can know others and the character you're trying to portray. And so identity is everything. And so you have to discover yourself if you're an actor. That's cool. And I, I love that you brought up empathy because we talk a lot about in the design process when you like for added idea and we're talking about design, empathy interviews become a really key starting point mm -hmm. to understand if you're designing something for a user, you have to understand who the user is. You have mm -hmm. to get to know them and develop a sense of empathy for the person you're designing for. From the lens of someone studying theater, you're doing the same process, but for a character to really dive in and understand who the character is. Do you do something like an empathy interview or like 
how do you walk students through the process of like, here's the character you're going to portray. You need to get to know them. You need to understand them, see things from, what does that process look like? How do you walk students through that? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of times it's through your imagination and you do a pretend interview with that person. And so you kind of have to play both yourself mm -hmm. and that person at the same time. And so oftentimes what I have students do is they get a list of questions and they write down their personal answers to the mm. questions. And then they have to see where does their character do something different? Oh, where okay. does their character have that different opinion or that different feeling about a specific thing? So that way they also can differentiate between themselves and their character. Because oftentimes with acting, things can get muddled. Yeah, for sure. Right. And so we hear a lot about method acting and we hear a lot about, you know, like actors, um, with really bad mental health because of the fact that they're diving into these characters that have a lot of problems. And so being able to identify where you begin and that person begins and where mm -hmm. you end and that person ends helps mitigate some of that. Yeah. And I don't think I answered your question. I think no, I went that's on exactly a right. No, you totally tangent, did. No, that's um, perfect. Which is one of you asked me what my superpower is, Christian. Tangents. I, I lied to you. I, I lied to you. Tangents it. are my superpower. Um, but it's just something that's really cool to me. Like when you are able to have empathy, even for a character, like, you know, we have kids who are in Clue right now. Characters are murderers in Clue. How can you have an em empathetic view of a character who killed someone, you know? And, but here's the thing is in society that people are going to make decisions that are, you don't agree with. Hopefully not kill people. That's not like what I'm saying, but we have to learn how to have empathy and understand why someone made that decision. So that way you can see where they're going and where they're going to end up. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to ask a question. Is that hard for high school kids to do? Do you find it's challenging? Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually think that it's harder sometimes to identify yourself. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I have, because when you're in high school, you are going through discovering yourself and you still don't know exactly where you want to go or who you want to end up being. I mean, sometimes I don't even know where I want to go or who I want to end up being. Let's be real. Yeah. You know, like identity is a constant continuum. And so it can be difficult to be able to identify yourself, but sometimes it's easier to identify a character. And then you can find a character that you empathize with and say, oh, hey, wait, I am like this character because of A, B, C, and D. And then they're able to discover themselves further. That's so interesting. Because the reason I ask is like, we, you know, we work with high school kids and my yeah. experience with high school kids, when you ask them to reflect, any sort of like second tier thinking, a lot of times the response is like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> or like, tell me about why you feel that way. I don't know, just do. Like, you know, the, yeah. getting to that level of like, high level reflection is really tough. Mm -hmm. But what I hear you saying is maybe it's easier for kids to enter into that through the lens of another character first, so that then they can start to expound on who they are as like a proxy almost. Yes, wow. exactly. That's incredible. And usually we start out kids with characters that are, they are super similar with. So that way they have more to identify with. Yeah. Ooh, sorry, microphone. Yeah. Um, so that way they have more to identify with because we want them to be able to get into this character. And then we start the challenge of differentiation of characters sure. and having characters that are so vastly different than mm -hmm. that person that you are like, oh wait, I really have to like look deep inside myself and find that little tiny speck of me that is like that person. Yeah. And then you learn how to take that little teeny tiny speck and blow it out of proportion. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about uh, one thing in particular. So behind the scenes role, folks did not get to see this part of our conversation, but you had mentioned uh, improv. Yeah. And uh, how it's actually like, maybe the hardest form yes. of theater. And, uh, you know, forgive me for segue, um, but I often think that like teaching is improv. Yes. Right? It's, a, <laughs> it's a significant game of yes and. Oh, um, yes. And so I'm, I'm wondering, right, like how, uh, when you're presented with something in the classroom, right, that might be a challenge mm -hmm. or it might be something difficult or having students unfold or in that process is discovery. Like where are ways in which you've had to say or maybe a story in which you've had to say yes and so that we can still get to 
you know, the destination of the thing that we're trying to teach or help you unfold and dis discover. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that oftentimes, like when something goes awry in the classroom, for me personally, it's because I didn't give them the reason why, why we're doing something. Mm, okay. And so, and then I have to take a step back and be like, yes, you're not wrong. And this is why we're doing this, mm. this way. So in high school theater, not only am I the director, but I also am the producer. I'm also making sure costumes are getting done. I have a wonderful teaching partner who does a lot of the tech side as well, but we're two people doing a job of about 200 people. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes things go wrong and that is okay. It is okay for things to go wrong. And so learning with improv, like learning to just be flexible and going with that, and, but most of the time inside of my classroom, if something goes wrong, it's because I didn't explain why. Why are we doing this thing? And then I have to take a step back and be like, yes, what you're saying makes total sense. And I did not give you the reason why, and that's why you're feeling this way. So let me give you the reason why. And then usually they're like, oh yeah, that's great. Oh, okay, I understand why we're doing this now. And I'm like, fabulous, let's go for it. And then. If it still doesn't make sense, then I take the journey with them. Hmm. And then we go and we try to find a solution because the point of being inside of the theater classroom is not so that way you're uncomfortable all the time. So that way you're like, I'm scared to be a tree right now and Kay's making me be a tree and now a cloud and now a rock and now a tree. Um, I don't want a student to come in and be like, I don't want to be a tree. I don't want to do this. No, thank you. So. I like to take them on the journey with me and mm. I like to go on that journey with them so that way they know that they have somebody by their side. Because oftentimes when I was younger, I didn't have someone by my side cheering mm. me on. And that's what I want for my students is that yeah. they have someone cheering them on and saying, yeah, it's hard. This is difficult and we're going to do this and I'm going to be here every step of the way. Yeah. Um, that's a great segue because as we start, I, we've talked a lot about how individually each student develops empathy through the lens of theater, how mm -hmm. they personally discover who they are, but obviously they're doing this in the context of community mm -hmm. with other students. How do you see your work as a theater teacher um, with all these skills that you have bleed into mentor group where you're building a sense of community with students talking openly about who they are, how they're plans are with some students that might not even be in theater. Yeah. How, how do they, how does that translate over as a mentor? Well, the funny story is I only have two theater kids in my MPG yeah. and both of them are tech theater kids. Yeah. So they do not want to perform. And so I'm up there oftentimes doing a full performance for the MPG and they're all like, <laughs> why? We're <laughs> illustration majors. And I'm like, I'm sorry, y'all. Um, but what I have learned through theater is that the goofier and the sillier and the most embarrassing version of myself that I can be allows everyone else to be the goofiest and the silliest and most embarrassing version of themselves. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with being goofy. There's yeah. nothing wrong with being silly. And it is fun to be embarrassing sometimes because guess what? everybody's laughing and we're having a good time. And as long as we're not laughing at a specific person being mm -hmm. like, ha ha, you suck. You know, like it's good. It's good for us to be laughing and being silly and goofy. Um, but because of the fact that I have students who don't necessarily like performing, we end up doing we end up doing things that are out of the box for me, which is really great because then mm -hmm. I get to discover more about myself. We get to build things, which is something that I don't get to do inside of my classroom oh. often. We get to draw, we get to build community in different ways. While still, I still usually add a little theater pizzazz and then they're all like, hey, you're silly. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm the silliest goose that has ever lived. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they all end up coming along for the ride because they know that I will be the most embarrassing person yeah. in the room. So they don't have to worry about everybody looking at them. Everybody's going to be looking at me falling on my face and it's yeah. going to be a great time for all of us. Yeah, I can imagine that's very um, disarming for a lot of kids yeah. in a good way. Like, you know, if you set the stage like this is who we're going to be, you can all poke fun at me. Then it allows teenagers to be, well, 
you know, we're not going to worry about us being the butt yeah. of the joke because that's already been made. Um, how do you get them to a point of reflection as a mentor? Like them start to think, cause you do have kids that are probably used to working with you in the theater, a yeah. couple kids from technical theater, but then like you said, you have illustration majors, you know, photographers, kids that are, you know, very introspective in how they approach their art. How, do you have to like do a lot of differentiation and how you engage with each of them individually as a mentor? Yes, absolutely. Um, so for some students, I have one-on-one -on -one meetings mm -hmm. with them during mentor group and then we're able to discuss and oh my gosh when they show me their sketchbooks I am blown away every single yeah. time mm -hmm. and so it's so cool to be able to be inside of that world as well and um, be able to encourage them in other forms of art and then we also have big group activities and so one of my favorite things that we do is every single season we choose a big group activity this um, this season we made spooky town and so oh, wow. what we did is we created a cardboard fort of um, a spooky town, like based off of Halloween town. Yeah. And then we all sat inside the fort and we um, did our community circle inside yeah. of the fort. So we built something together and then we um, ended up sitting in the circle together inside of the thing mm -hmm. that we built all together, which I thought was incredible. I don't remember the question anymore. <laughs> no, that's great. I was just curious how you have to differentiate meeting with all these different types of students in mentor group, um, which it sounds, I mean, like you do projects together, you create the space together, and then it allows you to have these one-on-one -on -one individual meetings. Um, that sense of belonging, just this morning mm -hmm. I had a conversation with our school district's general counsel, our attorney, and he was asking me about Soda Sammy and Idea and some of the kids we've worked with. And when I explained kind of what mentor group is, he was like, you know, I think it's so important that, yeah, we teach reading, math, science, all that stuff, but to create a sense of belonging where a kid shows up and just feels like they're a part of something, that's gotta be pretty, pretty incredible. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of at the core of yeah. what we do. That's like pretty essential. Um, do you, I mean, do you feel like doing that with this larger group of kids that have all these differing abilities is, is, um, is it a big challenge to try to create that sense of belonging? I don't think so. Hmm. I don't think it is a big challenge, but it's not because of anything I'm doing. Right. It's because of what the kids do. Okay. Because the kids come into the room and immediately welcome each other mm -hmm. inside of the room. And I don't know, maybe they learned it from me at some point. It's possible. I don't, I have no idea, but they come in and it doesn't matter if they're ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, they all support one another. Mm. And you will see, I have seniors who are helping freshmen with their geometry homework. I have juniors helping the sophomores because they're in chemistry right now. And they're like, ah, what do I do? How do I add this molecule together? And so they have this sense of community where like, I have your back and you have mine. And we're going to make sure that we all succeed together. And it's just amazing to watch students who in ninth grade would barely speak inside of the circle to 10th grade helping the ninth graders who are scared to talk inside of the community circle just blossom. Like you said, the silly little like flower opening up metaphor, like we're all blossoming, but it's true. And they use each other as supports. And then I am there to facilitate and support even further. And it's just an amazing group of kids. So it's so incredible you say that. I'm gonna just add in this thing really quick because yeah. I just read about this and you touched on it. Uh, there was a professor in the 70s that was working at a university and noticed a discrepancy between the success in his math class between African-American students and Asian students, mm -hmm. which is a common discrepancy that's seen in a lot of educational circles. And he was wondering, like, what is the difference? Because I don't believe fundamentally that there's any difference in ability between these two mm -hmm. groups of students. And I don't even believe that they come in with different skill sets, but clearly over the course of their time at th this university he was at, there's different growth rates. And when he started to unpack and do these empathy interviews with students and understand who they were, the success factor that didn't exist for the African-American students that did for the Asian students was a sense of community. Hmm. That it was culturally normed for the Asian students to work together and support each other and ask questions and ask for help. And for some reason that wasn't for other cultural groups. So he started this whole plan and he became legendary for it of building this um, 
he created like a, a a separate program for students that was built around asking for support and invited students to participate and then started scaffolding like how do you actually create supports where students are asking for help and mm -hmm. studying together instead of studying alone and within three years the two groups started to follow along the same line and uh, their growth rates academically were almost identical wow. and to me like that is academically success successful like it's it's not so much about instructional strategies it's about creating a sense of belonging and creating a network of support within student groups to say you can ask for help and yeah. you can get support from another student and ask upperclassmen how did you get through this and those seem like soft skills we talk about them like as yeah. you know oh this is that's just the feel feel good stuff we need to get down to the hardcore math to really make sure it happens that is the hardcore math <laughs> that's how you get to those gains well and the, like soft skills in my opinion, are just as important as the skills to be able to do an algebraic proof, mm -hmm. you know, because in theater, if somebody doesn't end up going into theater, so if somebody comes into my class and they do four years of acting with me, my goal is not that they become an actor. I would love for them to become an actor, but that's not my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal is that they have interpersonal communication skills, that they are able to work with other people well, that they have a really strong sense of self and they know who they are and what they want inside of the world, and that they have been a part of a community and have felt that belonging feeling. And those transfer over into whatever job they're gonna do. You're gonna have to talk to people, no matter what job you do, you're gonna have to talk to people. So if you are able to have that interpersonal communication that you can develop inside of the theater, then that's going to help you later on in life, even if you don't end up becoming a Broadway star. Um, I'm, I'm curious about one more piece of that formula yeah. and want to ask you about it in a roundabout way. Okay. Right. So, and coming back to the, the idea around improv, mm -hmm. this is like my favorite okay. at this point. I love improv um, too, so it's fine. I, I, so I've, I've been a part of a show. Uh, I'll leave the show unnamed because I don't want the audience to know that it's, that it's improv. Um, <laughs> but basically there's a, a series of poets, there's okay. a band, there is uh, a group of singers. And mm -hmm. like, I don't know that the audience knows, but we have no plan when we get there, right? Yeah. Like individually, we know what we would do a set mm -hmm. list as artists or whatever those things. But like the, the whole challenge is that we work together in front of people. Yeah. Um, and the reason why I think that show has been really successful is because all of the folks involved trust each other. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, like in your mentor group or even in theater, like, do you think that building of trust can be structured? Is it organic? Are there activities? Are there and here's my weird teacher hat. Right? Are there are there best practices that I can use for? But or or does that just get <laughs> developed over time? Um, and in some form of like us trying to solve something together. Like, how do you yeah. think that that gets built amongst the groups that you work with? Absolutely. Well, I think it's both. I think it's, I think that that sort of trust, you can display it and you can earn it. And it also can come naturally, but you have to work for it. So if I walk into my classroom and I haven't met any of these students yet, and I say, all right, just trust me. I'm going to get blank stares like they don't know me. They don't know who I am. They don't know what my values are. They don't know if I'm going to lead them down a path that is not going to be a fun path for them. And so for me, the first point of trust is knowing someone and not just them knowing me, but me knowing them. So first is relationship building in order to be able to create that sense of trust. Like if Zach had asked me to come on this podcast one day before like I got hired, however many years ago, I'd be like, Zach, I don't know you. <laughs> like, I don't, uh, know like you. <laughs> I don't know you. I don't know what this is about. What do you mean? I still do that with him sometimes. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, like true. you have to, you know, keep him on his toes. <laughs> it's how life works. Um, but, you know, if we didn't have that re previous relationship, I wouldn't be like trust trusting him to use my voice right now. And so you have to build that relationship first, and then hopefully the dominoes will fall. Mm -hmm. But if you don't spend the time building the relationships with students, you don't give them any reason to trust you. And so then you end up building community 
between you and the students and also between the students themselves. Mm -hmm. And so building those relationships between them and also you as a bridge. So that way you're able to help them become better communicators and trust one another and be like, oh, I know that when this person says they're going to do something, they're going to do it. Or I know that if I do this in front of this group of people, that they are not going to judge me. And it takes time and it takes effort and it takes a huge amount of responsibility mm -hmm. because you have to be vulnerable as the adult in the room. And also the students have to be vulnerable and it's not easy. And yet it is the most powerful thing that you can have in a classroom. Because if yeah. I'm having a bad day, the students who know me very well will be like, we can tell Kay is having a bad day, hmm. you know? And I think that I'm doing a really good job of like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> acting, I'm not. Um, <laughs> and they'll be like, hey Kay, what's going on? Can we help you out with anything? And I'll be like, oh yeah, I actually could help with this, this, and this. And since they have built that relationship with me and I've built it with them, I can trust that they're going to go and get those things done. And so it's taking the time to get to know the person and them getting to know you as well. And so I think that it just comes with a lot of conversation, a lot of um, listening just to understand and not to respond and being there, just being there. You don't even have to say anything. You can just be there. Mm, that's awesome. I just wanted to follow up real quick. The guy I was talking about, was, his name was Yuri Treisman. It was at Cal Berkeley in the late cool. 70s and early 80s. Um, and he started this whole thing called the Treisman model. So we'll put a link in the description to kind of a more um, comprehensive description of, of that study and how it was found. But it's all at that same idea of yeah. you said creating a bond, not just between you and students through modeling vulnerability, but allowing students to then practice that to build connections between students mm -hmm. so that they can rely on each other for support. Exactly. Um, I don't know, I think it's pretty groundbreaking that concept, right? It's not just about the teacher's representation of this is how we're learning to students, but you're creating a culture that allows students to teach each other. Yeah, into perpetuity is also what I heard you yeah. say, right? Because you have now seniors who are leaning into freshmen, yeah. yeah, freshmen who will have that example, who will then become upperclassmen at one point. Mm -hmm. And at some point, because of the early investment, right, there's just a trickle down effect. Yeah that gets to stay. Yeah. I think we, nerdy for a quick second, um, <laughs> but I think we miss that a lot in um, like our sciences around people's development, like mm -hmm. Maslow's is uh, completely individual based. Yes. Right, and like self-actualization being the top of the pyramid. Um, and I've recently like uh, been leaning into um, like the Blackfeet Nation's depiction of I haven't Maslow. seen that oh, one. Oh yeah. yeah. It's inverted. Yeah, link yeah. in the description, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Two but, links. Yeah, I mean, self-actualization is the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And then there's an idea of um, sustainability all the way to this idea of cultural perpetuity or transcendence. Yeah. Right? To where this is just how it ought to be. Um, and I think that that's beautiful that that's something that you're creating in your, your space, in your classroom, mm -hmm. with your students, in your mentor groups. Uh, and you said that you had limited superpowers in our behind the scenes conversation. <laughs> um, it seems like you have an immense amount of, of superpowers and uh, that they've been passed on to your students. I hope so. But um, I also want to say you said, I build the community. I don't build it. Mm. Me and the students build it together. Mm -hmm. It's It wouldn't be anything without the students. Mm -hmm. So, And I know that sounds like, oh, uh, like that's what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> no, like, it's that's true. What it's very Kay true. supposed to say. No, like actually, I couldn't do it without the incredible kids that are inside of my room. Like those kids, phenomenal humans, mm -hmm. not just on stage, but off stage as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's really awesome to be able to build that with them. Mm -hmm. um, yo, I think that's an excellent note to sing us off with. Um, I don't have to sing, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, we could be a little Metaphor barbershop group here. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, I'm joking. Uh, okay, no, thank you. Thank you for uh, the things that you're creating. Thank you for the role that you play here. And thank you for uh, taking the time to have a conversation with us today about all the wonderful things that are happening here. So grateful for you uh, mm -hmm. and hope we get to have you back again soon. Mm -hmm. But of course, can yeah. I do my sign off? Yes, do your sign Fabulous. off. Fabulous. Well, I hope everyone has a good morning. And if I don't see you again, good afternoon, good evening and good night. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs>
Elements of Education is a 501c3 nonprofit organization in Tacoma, Washington, dedicated to changing public education to better serve the specific and diverse needs of students in our public schools. For more information about how you can support the work that we do, please visit elementsofed.org, or you can find us on Instagram at Elements of Education or on our website. 